we all know that a lot of times people resist the idea that something has changed and that they resist recognizing when something is very different. And I think that Warwick has something here when she argues that that's what's going on, that people are clinging to the past and a sort of mythology of capitalism. But the way that she thinks about it is, is fairly, it's fairly uh, convincing. Um, you know, of course, there was feudalism in, in the medieval period, lords and serfs, the lords owned the land, the serfs uh, worked on the land generation after generation. The system was fairly stable until it wasn't. The serfs paid a sort of rent in the form of money or, or in the form of goods that they produced. Um, and the landlords uh, allowed them generationally to access the same land. Um, until they wouldn't anymore. When they started to enclose their land because they figured out how to make more money grazing animals on it, um, then they started to throw the serfs out. This created a glut of labor that moved into urban areas. It created the conditions for capitalism. Capitalism becomes full blown in the uh, mid 19th century. Um, and at first, I'm sure, as capitalism developed, and even in the mid-19th century, many aristocrats were still more or less thinking they were in charge. And they didn't maybe even quite understand this new class of upstarts, the bourgeoisie, the, the people in the city making money kind of dishonestly. And I don't know, I, I suspect that there was probably a, a great deal of confusion about exactly what was going on amongst that older class. But the capitalist class had learned how to use this surplus of labor and things were very difficult at first for the people doing the work. Um, but as time went by, capitalism developed and it became very clear, eventually it was clear to everybody that capitalism was a system that was different from the previous one and had usurped it and the capitalists now had the political and economic power and not the older aristocratic class. Work is arguing that we're in one of those liminal or transitional periods now where a new class is emerging, but it's very difficult for people to imagine that. People want to think that their, you know, their world is fairly static, even though the capitalist system has, it's so incredibly dynamic that it's kind of hard to believe that we're that kind of hidebound. But she's arguing that if we just kind of clear-eyed look at who controls the means of production, that at this point in time, this new class is emerging that actually controls the means of production without owning it. And whereas the capitalists um, more or less directed the labor of the workers, the vectorlists um, command the labor of the capitalists. They outsource with their superior information technology all of the machinery wherever wherever it will work um, for their enterprise without having to own it. All right, so you know Naomi Klein in her book No Logo a while back um, wrote about the the way that some companies had figured out how to make most of their money off of their system and off of their reputation and their brand. And so this was an intimation. She had an intimation of what was going on, that something different was happening. Now, for most of us, including Klein, I think that was called something like neoliberal capitalism, right? Or corporate capitalism. And many people have written about how that's different, but not, not really fathom that it's maybe something fundamentally different is going on. Now, Wark says one has to ask whether the ruling class presiding over this mode of production is still adequately described as capitalist. It seems no longer necessary to directly own the means of production. A remarkable amount of the valuation of the leading companies of our time consists not of tangible assets, but rather of information. A company in its brands its patents, its trademarks, its reputation, its logistics, and perhaps above all, its distinctive practices of evaluating information itself. That's what a company is. I should say a company is those things, all right? And now, you know, back when I was in college, I worked for this 
company whose job it was, this was during the Reagan administration, um, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were making a big splash in the world and their ideological perspective was that we needed to you know, revive private industry, the private sector, and we needed to do that by shrinking government. And one of the ways that we would do that would be to privatize the government services that could be, okay? And I was working for a company just for one summer that went around interviewing government workers, trying to ascertain what they did for their jobs, trying to write up um, operating procedures to describe what units and offices did so that this company could figure out whether those services could be privatized or not. I didn't really know what was going on at the time I did this. I just thought it was a nice summer gig. But what was happening was government had outsourced to this company um, the job of figuring out whether more outsourcing could occur and how it should occur. And I'm sure the company was involved in then finding other um, corporations or companies that could do these jobs to put the government workers out of business and put the, uh, you know, direct the government funds to a particular private firm. Okay, so now, of course, government outsources so much, it's become so commonplace that we hardly think about it. Everything from adoption and uh, foster care services to health insurance with the Affordable Care Act in the United States to military contractors. Um, and there's two ways of looking at this. The old way was to see this as a, a great boon to the private sector. Well, they do things more efficiently and so on and so forth. But another way to look at this, which has now you know, finally dawned on me, is that this has been a great absorption of the supposed private sector into the government um, purview. And the government, of course, still pulls the strings and is heavily involved in the economy and in fact is is probably the number one customer in a lot of industries. Um, so it's not as though government has gotten out of the private sector. Strangely enough, government's gotten way more into the private sector. But you see, when people first started out and for a long time, haven't really fathomed how much of a socialization in a way um, this is. Government was the original outsourcer and this idea had legs and so now what we've got is corporate industry doing vectoral outsourcing the top capitalists you might say have figured out that it is better to not own the means of production but to own the means of controlling the means of production if that makes sense to be the owner of the technology of the systems, okay, of the platforms, of the, you know, the techniques uh, to analyze information, to gather and analyze it. This gives them the ability to control what other people own. So this is a new type of business that has emerged that amasses and wields an incredible amount of the information and outsources the actual production of commodities and services to capitalists. So you see what's happened is the capitalists have now fallen under the vectorlists, okay? The capitalists no longer on top, but this new class, which does not own primarily, but controls uh, their means of production. And Work points out, and the extensive globalization that we now have, the globalization of the economy, uh, would never have been able to happen without extremely advanced information technology. And without these uh, companies that do little but uh, figure out the way to move money, labor, commodities, manufacturing capabilities to be able to move and control all of these and to change them as necessary to rearrange the game pieces on the board um, to continue to make a profit. So they are extracting a profit from um, the capitalist class and it's a growing amount, okay? Um, the vector economy looks more and more like this. 
right? The people who produce are, you know, definitely working for the vectorless class. The people who own the property are also working for the vectorless class. My intellectual property, if I decide to publish it with Amazon so that, that it is a Kindle book, I actually do all the work, okay? I did this with a textbook that I wrote. It has to be formatted. The author is responsible for doing that, uploading the book, marketing the book, and so on. Amazon provides a platform and takes a nice cut from Kindle books, not from mine, because I'm not making any money off of it anyway. Um, Airbnb, you know, a, a great example of a company that extracts profit from people working with their own property and taking most of the risk. Um, food delivery companies, also a great example of this, as well as Uber. Um, in those two cases, they're asking people to use their time, their labor, and their property, their car, um, and to take their lives into their own hands and to, to absorb most of the risk, the wear and tear and the accidents to their car. It is dubious whether a person working for a delivery company is ever actually making any money if you take into account the loss of the use of their car due to depreciation and possible accidents. Vectorlism then profits without the liability of owning the means of production. They, they remove or outsource the liability. And also in the process, outsource the responsibility for social or environmental impacts. In fact, that goes nowhere. Interestingly, uh, remember I talked about the tendency in capitalism for the rate of profit to fall and that this being a problem for the capitalist class to be able to continue to eke out a profit um, as they kind of consume each other. Well, conceivably, the, okay, the vectorless class has figured out a way to make a profit in that environment. It doesn't help the capitalists out very much. They're still in that situation of being very much in a bind. Now they've got the additional factor of having to pay um, or you know, work for the vectorless class and basically contract with them and or pay them for their services. Um, Work points out that this creates inevitably conflicts between vectorless and capitalists. That we'll probably see more in the future, legal disputes and uh, political disputes regarding those two types of businesses. And it also produces an inevitable conflict potential between vectorlists and hackers, okay? Remember, hackers are those people who create new information for the vectorlists so that they can own it. So for instance, a hacker might be a scientist working for Bayer, which now owns Monsanto, and, and she's in the lab, you know, creating a new strain of GMO corn. Okay, that's pesticide resistant and uh, which, which, which needs less water and can be more easily managed on giant monocultural farms, right? That person is creating through in the lab for the vectorlist new information that they can own from something that's very, very old, corn, okay? Um, at a sort of a lower level, you might say the person working for Stitch Fix is, is a hacker as well. The person who's the stylist on the other end there, who's putting together your latest outfit to consider, um, is creating out of things that already exist a package that is something new and unique that can be sold by Stitch Fix, which doesn't make the clothing, okay? probably does have a warehouse somewhere where it puts it together though and ships it out, right? Contracts with the stylist who probably works from home and I don't know, could be paid by the customer or by the sale. So the hackers do a lot of the work 
and are actually actually have their fingers, so to speak, on the technology um, and oftentimes create the new technology that is often used to, to actually make work more precarious and temporary and contractual as well. Are they like the factory workers of the previous capitalist era? This is a question that works writing um, inevitably brings to mind. The workers in the capitalist system for a certain period of time kind of tried to feel their power, you know, through unionization. And then that kind of that kind of came to an end really in the 1970s in the United States. Um, when uh, they, they really were defeated by the capitalist class. Um, there, were, there were more workers, really. I think the fact is there were more workers um, than there were jobs. And so during the 70s, as workers began to go on strike during a recession, um, it did not work. Unions were broken and they have never been the same. Uh, the, the strategy of outsourcing and of uh, going elsewhere, you know, in the world to find workers to get cheaper labor was successful. But for a time, labor tried to push back and it tried to get some of the profit, some, of, some more of the profit that was being extracted from them back into their own pocketbook. I think Wark is, is asking, are, are hackers in a somewhat similar situation here? Are they the factory workers of the vectorless class? And do they have the same potential or a similar potential to wield power if they organize? And if so, what would this organization look like? Well, at one point she mentions platform cooperativism. This is on page 94 and doesn't go on too much at that point specifically about, about how that might take place. It did remind me of the concept of time banks, uh, which would be probably a very small scale um, and partial um, way of thinking about cooperativism, platform cooperativism. Um, but it would be the idea of people creating platforms, um, hackers, and consumers creating platforms through which they could, to a certain extent, bypass the vectorless class, okay? Creating their own cooperative vectors. Um, time banks are where people, basically you work, you, you do something for somebody for one hour with your expertise, you earn a credit. You need like a hole um, repaired in your wall, you see that somebody offers that, you use your hour to get that service and no money exchanges hands, right? I don't know if that's a totally perfect example, but I'm trying, I always try to come up with examples for what this might mean. I'm sure that's a very small scale thing compared to what work is thinking of. I'm hoping that in the next couple chapters, there will be a more concrete idea of what that would look like because she's very much suggesting, I think, that hackers have this untapped power and that if they organize, um, they might be able to push back against the vectorless class. So anyway, today I just wanted to, to leave you with this idea to contemplate and think about, and I'd be interested to hear what you do think in the comments below. Um, is vectorlism a new economic system? Are vectorlists a new economic class? Um, is capitalism no longer um, the ruling system?